Second part of chapter 10 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Example of fame. Fame, for example, is a good. Its value arises from a certain movement of will and emotion which is elicited by the thought that one's name might be associated with great deeds and with the memory of them. The glow of this thought baths the object it describes, so that fame is felt to have a value quite distinct from that which the expectation of fame may have in the present moment. Should this expectation be foolish and destined to prove false, it would have no value, and be indeed the more ludicrous and repulsive the more pleasure its dupe took in it, and the longer his illusion lasted. The heart is resolutely set on its object and despises its own phenomena, not reflecting that its emotions have first revealed that object's worth and alone can maintain it. For if a man cares nothing for fame, what value has it? This projection of interest into excellence takes place mechanically and is in the first instance irrational. Did all glow die out from memory and expectation the events represented remaining unchanged we should be incapable of assigning any value to those events just as if eyes were lacking we should be incapable of assigning color to the world which would notwithstanding remain as it is at present so fame could never be regarded as a good if the idea of fame gave no pleasure. Yet now, because the idea pleases, the reality is regarded as a good, absolute and intrinsic. This moral hypostasis involved in the love of fame could never be rationalized, but would subsist unmitigated or die out unobserved were it not associated with other conceptions and other habits of estimating values. For the passions are humanized only by being juxtaposed and forced to live together. As fame is not man's only goal and the realization of it comes into manifold relations with other interests no less vivid, we are able to criticize the impulse to pursue it. Fame may be the consequence of benefits conferred upon mankind. In that case, the abstract desire for fame would be reinforced and, as it were, justified by its congruity with the more voluminous and stable desire to benefit our fellow men. Or, again, the achievements which ensure fame and the genius that wins it probably involve a high degree of vitality and many profound inward satisfactions to the man of genius himself, so that again the abstract love of fame would be reinforced by the independent and more rational desire for a noble and comprehensive experience. On the other hand, the minds of posterity, whose homage is craved by the ambitious man, will probably have very false conceptions of his thoughts and purposes. What they will call by his name will be, in a great measure, a fiction of their own fancy and not his portrait at all. Would Caesar recognize himself in the current notions of him, drawn from some school history or perhaps from Shakespeare's satirical portrait? Would Christ recognize himself upon our altars, or in the romances about him constructed by imaginative critics? And not only is remote experience thus hopelessly lost and misrepresented, but even this nominal memorial ultimately disappears. The love of fame, if tempered by these and similar considerations, would tend to take a place in man's ideal such as its roots in human nature and its functions in human progress might seem to justify. 
it would be rationalized in the only sense in which any primary desire can be rationalized, namely, by being combined with all others in a consistent whole. How much of it would survive a thorough sifting and criticism may well remain in doubt. The result would naturally differ for different temperaments and in different states of society, the wisest men, perhaps, while they would continue to feel some love of honour and some interest in their image in other minds, would yet wish that posterity might praise them as Salus praises Cato by saying, Esse quam videri bonus maluit. He preferred worth to reputation. Side note. Disproportionate interest in the aesthetic. The fact that value is attributed to absent experience according to the value experience has in representation appears again in one of the most curious anomalies in human life. The exorbitant interest which thought and reflection take in the form of experience and the slight account they make of its intensity or volume. Seasickness and childbirth when they are over the pangs of despised love when that love is finally forgotten or requited, the travail of sin when one's salvation is assured, all melt away and dissolve like a morning mist leaving a clear sky without a vestige of sorrow. So also with nearly remembered and not reproducible pleasures, the buoyancy of youth when absurdity is not yet tedious, the rapture of sport or passion, the immense peace found in a mystical surrender to the universal. All these generous ardors count for nothing when they are once gone. The memory of them cannot cure a fit of the blues, nor raise an irritable mortal above some petty act of malice or vengeance, or reconcile him to foul weather. An ode of Horus, on the other hand, a scientific monograph or a well-written page of music is a better antidote to melancholy than thinking on all the happiness which one's own life or that of the universe may ever have contained. Why should overwhelming masses of suffering and joy affect imagination so little while it responds sympathetically to aesthetic and intellectual irritants of very slight intensity objects that, it must be confessed, are of almost no importance to the welfare of mankind. Why should we be so easily awed by artistic genius and exalt men whose works we know only by name, perhaps, and whose influence upon society has been infinitesimal, like a Pindar or a Leonardo, while we regard great merchants and inventors as ignoble creatures in comparison. Why should we smile at the inscription in Westminster Abbey, which calls the inventor of the spinning jenny one of the true benefactors of mankind? Is it not probable, on the whole, that he has had a greater and less equivocal influence on human happiness than Shakespeare, with all his plays and sonnets. But the cheapness of cotton cloth produces no particularly delightful image in the fancy to be compared with Hamlet or Imogen. There is a prodigious selfishness in dreams. They live perfectly deaf and invulnerable amid the cries of the real world. Side note. Irrational religious allegiance. The same aesthetic bias appears in the moral sphere. Utilitarians have attempted to show that the human conscience commends precisely those actions which tend to secure general happiness, and that the notions of justice and virtue prevailing in any age vary with its social economy and the prices it is able to attain. And... If due allowance is made for the complexity of the subject, we may reasonably admit that the precepts of obligatory morality bear this relation to the general welfare. 
thus virtue means courage in a soldier probity in a merchant and chastity in a woman but if we turn from the morality required of all to the type regarded as perfect and ideal we find no such correspondence to the benefits involved the selfish imagination intervenes here and attributes an absolute and irrational value to those figures that entertain it with the most absorbing and dreamful emotions the character of christ for instance which even the least orthodox among us are in the habit of holding up as a perfect model is not the character of a benefactor but of a martyr a spirit from a higher world lacerated in its passage through this uncomprehending and perverse existence healing and forgiving out of sheer compassion sustained by his inner affinities to the supernatural and absolutely disenchanted with all earthly or political goods christ did not suffer like prometheus for having bestowed or wished to bestow any earthly blessing the only blessing he bequeathed was the image of himself upon the cross whereby men might be comforted in their own sorrows rebuked in their worldliness driven to put their trust in the supernatural and united by their common indifference to the world in one mystic brotherhood as men learned these lessons or were inwardly ready to learn them they recognized more and more clearly in jesus their heaven-sent redeemer and in following their own conscience and desperate idealism into the desert or the cloister in ignoring all civic virtues and allowing the wealth art and knowledge of the pagan world to decay they began what they felt to be an imitation of christ all natural impulses all natural ideals subsisted of course beneath this theoretic asceticism writhed under its unearthly control and broke out in frequent violent eruptions against it in the life of each man as well as in the course of history yet the image of christ remained in men's heart and retained its marvellous authority so that even now when so many who call themselves christians being pure children of nature are without the least understanding of what christianity came to do in the world they still offer his person and words a sincere if in articulate worship try to transform that sacrificial and crucified spirit as much as their bungling fancy can into a patron of philistia felix why this persistent adoration of a character that is the extreme negation of all that these good souls inwardly value and outwardly pursue because the image of christ and the associations of his religion apart from their original import remain rooted in the mind they remain the focus for such wayward emotions and mystic intuitions as their magnetism can still attract and the value which this hallowed compound possesses in representation is transferred to its nominal object and christ is the conventional name for all the impulses of religion no matter how opposite to the christian side note pathetic idealizations symbols when their significance has been great outlive their first significance the image of christ was a last refuge to the world it was a consolation and a new ground for hope from which no misfortune could drive the worshipper its value as an idea was therefore immense as to the lover the idea of his untasted joys or to the dying man the idea of health and invigorating sunshine 
the votary can no more ask himself whether this deity in its total operation has really blessed him and deserved his praise than the lover can ask if his lady is worth pursuing or the expiring cripple whether it would be in very truth a benefit to be once more young and whole that life is worth living is the most necessary of assumptions and were it not assumed the most impossible of conclusions experience by its passive weight of joy and sorrow can neither inspire nor prevent enthusiasm only a present ideal will avail to move the will and if realized to justify it a saint's halo is an optical illusion it glorifies his actions whatever their eventual influence in the world because they seem to have when rehearsed dramatically some tenderness or rapture or miracle about them thus it appears that the great figures of art or religion together with all historic and imaginative ideals advance insensibly on the values they represent the image has more lustre than the original and is often the more important and influential fact things are esteemed as they weigh in representation a memorable thing people say in their eulogies little thinking to touch the ground of their praise for things are called great because they are memorable they are not remembered because they were great the deepest pangs the highest joys the widest influences are lost to our perception in its haste and if in some rational moment reconstructed and acknowledged are soon forgotten again and cut off from living consideration but the emptiest experience even the most pernicious tendency if embodied in a picturesque image if reverberating in the mind with a pleasant echo is idealized and enshrined fortunate indeed was achilles that homer sang of him and fortunate the poets that make a public titillation out of their sorrows and ignorance this imputed and posthumous fortune is the only happiness they have the favours of memory are extended to those feeble realities and denied to the massive substance of daily experience when life dies when what was present becomes a memory its ghost flits still among the living feared or worshipped not for the experience it once possessed but for the aspect it now wears yet this injustice in representation speculatively so offensive is practically excusable for it is in one sense right and useful that all things whatever their original or inherent dignity should be valued at each moment only by their present function and utility sidenote inevitable impulsiveness in prophecy sidenote the test a controlled present ideal the error involved in attributing value to the past is naturally aggravated when values are to be assigned to the future in the latter case imagination cannot be controlled by circumstantial evidence and is consequently the only basis for judgment but as the conception of a thing naturally evokes an emotion different from that involved in its presence ideals of what is desirable for the future contain no warrant that the experience desired would when actual prove to be acceptable and good an ideal carries no extrinsic assurance that its realization would be a benefit to convince ourselves that an ideal has rational authority and represents a better experience than the actual condition it is contrasted with we must control the prophetic image by as many circumlocutions as possible as in the case of fame 
we must buttress or modify our spontaneous judgment with all the other judgment that the object envisage can prompt we must make our ideal harmonize with all experience rather than with a part only the possible error remains even then but a practical mind will always accept the risk of error when it has made every possible correction a rational will is not a will that has reason for its basis or that possesses any other proof that its realization would be possible or good than the oracle which a living will inspires and pronounces the rationality possible to the will lies not in its source but in its method an ideal cannot wait for its realization to prove its validity to deserve adhesion it needs only to be adequate as an ideal that is to express completely what the soul at present demands and to do justice to all extant interests end of chapter ten